Hey folks, it's Laura with Rain Tree Nursery. And today we have the pleasure of joining the fabulous Tom Conway from Tall Clover Farm here on Vashon Island in Western Washington State. Tom has a beautiful blog where he describes his life here on Vashon Island and the property and the house and island life. And I've been a huge fan of your blog for many years. And so it's such a treat to finally be able to come out and see your place and get a chance to talk to you. Oh, well, uh, thanks. I, I really appreciate that. And welcome. Well, it's, uh, it's one of those things, too, when you write a blog that we, when people see the reality, they go, oh, I see you've edited it heavily. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it's it's great. I've been here 17 years. And uh, you know, every, every, this is a work in process, progress and, uh, yeah, it's been fun and it's fun to sort of document it through the blog and let people know what I'm doing. And, and cause it, it is one of those great things. Like, I think we all do it where you look online and you go like, how do you grow a peach tree or when is a fig ripe or, you know, and, and you're, it's so helpful for all the sort of generous people out there that, uh, share their knowledge. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to be one of those people that, you know, over trial and error, yes. what's worked for me and what hasn't and what I like to do. Yeah. yeah. That's how, that's how I found your blog. Uh -huh. I was researching peach varieties here in the Pacific Northwest. And any of you folks that are growing peaches and live here in the Pacific Northwest know that that's really a challenge. And so I was trying to figure out by going online what peaches do well in the Pacific Northwest. And I came across your blog and you actually try oh, those peaches. I'm and all you about talk the peaches. About them. Yeah. yeah. So that's I will want to see okay. that for yeah, sure. For sure. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where like I um I y you know, you work so hard to get a peach, you know. In fact, I have a little uh, uh, an issue with when I go in a grocery store and I watch people and they inevitably pick up a peach and squeeze it and basically ruin it. Uh -huh. You know, like what it takes to grow that peach is so remarkable and like just to think that doesn't do anything to squeeze it, you know. I have a little uh, a whole personal jag on that about <laughs> squeezing peaches, you know, it doesn't tell you anything. But anyway, back to the growing the peaches. Uh -huh. So, it's like one of those things where you're going like, okay, this peach varieties, you're dead to me. You know, you're gone. I, I'm, I've worked too hard. It shouldn't be that hard. And especially with our climate, you know, it's all about peach leaf curl uh, resistance. So that's what I was, I was trying to find every variety that had a, a little bit of that or a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what was fun to see what would work and what wouldn't. And oddly on Vashon, they used to have a peach festival, which I don't know what they, what peaches they grew or what they put on them because it just seems sort of surprising nowadays right. to have an entire peach industry on the island when you, you're hard pressed to grow one or two now. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is something that's interesting. Vashon Island used to be an orchard. I mean, the mm -hmm. whole island was clear cut and used as an orchard mm -hmm. for the old sailing ships. And they would come and they would load up on fruit and take it down to San Francisco mm -hmm. and sell it. So it this island is beautiful now. It has so many trees. And I think back to those days when the whole thing was one big orchard. And you can still see it. Mm -hmm. When you're driving around, there's just all these beautiful, old, random fruit trees everywhere. It's gorgeous and so evocative. Yeah. In fact, um, this house was built in 1888 and they had an orchard and there are still trees off to the south um, you can see them uh, I have a couple stumps that are there are these beautiful twisted uh, but no longer with us mm -hmm. apple trees cherry trees that were on the property probably a hundred years ago wow. yeah like ghosts from the past uh-huh yeah <laughs> that's fun yeah it really is it's really it's great to sort of have that history and you discover it as you work the property when you're clearing brambles and you'll see these beautiful twisted stumps of fruit trees and mm. you wonder what was that you know i can't grow it now yeah. so one of the things i love about your blog is that you talk about the house mm -hmm. and the history of both the land and the house and as you said it was built in 1888, 1888 yeah. right what's it like to live in a big old beautiful house like this um it's a it's a really it's a it's a sweet house it's like i lived in a little house in seattle for a while mm -hmm. and 
that was a I loved the house, but it had weird it had like weird like you know how houses have vibes. Oh yeah. That had kind of like well, I don't know what the vibes are in here, but I'm not quite sure what happened. But huh. but this house, like it's one of those where you feel like you walk in and it's just a, a joyful experience. You know, mm. like you you it, it sounds kind of corny and kind of vash on juju, but it is like there's there's definitely there's been a lot of happiness, I feel, in the house. And ah. even the people I bought the house from at the time, they were a lovely lovely couple they had two kids they were getting too old to take care of it and i think the reason i ended up you know uh, i actually was able to buy the house was because all the things that needed fixing scared so many people <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't it didn't scare me i thought oh you know it's just me i can you know i can i can put up with just about anything and so um so it, it's been working out great i've been here 17 years and you know i Unlike my other house I bought, I, I'm more, I'm smarter. So I'm doing this, not the pretty stuff, but the system stuff. And oh, yes. Working on the foundation and working on, uh, you know, electrical and plumbing. And, and now I'm up to the point where I took the asbestos siding off. There was asbestos. I had it done by a professional company since it had a, 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 tox, a toxicity to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, and I've been waiting 17 years to do that. Oh and, and underneath it, because I had old photos, because I, I know they didn't, nobody would take that off. Uh, is the old uh, ship lap, or as I, as I researched it, I guess they call it actually Dutch lap, that type that has a yeah. double V on it. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, so I'm getting getting that painted and hopefully three to four weeks, you know, on Vashon, you're never quite sure um, when somebody says they're, gonna, they're, they're great people, <laughs> but it's like, we're all kind of like, oh, you know, we, we are very flexible. It's like, okay, this week or this week, maybe I'll do this week, you know? Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm just anticipating uh, it being done and, and, I actually love it like it is now. So it's evocative, it's kind, isn't it? It is. It's it, beautiful. She looks a little tired, but yeah. you know, restful, sort of of a certain age. Yes. A friend of mine calls her. He said, um, "She's like a a beautiful woman in a dirty dress." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Yeah, maybe she's been eating barbecue. I don't know." Like, you know. That's great. Yeah. Let's go look at what it's going to look like when it's painted. Sure. Shall we? Yeah. All my, right. my sample shot. Yes, your sample shot. Sure. Let's go. And here we have what it's going to look like when it's all done, right? Yeah, it's uh, um, uh, another friend of mine calls it Namaste on the Prairie. Um, it's sort of his <laughs> joke. But it's, um, yeah, I like bright colors. I didn't want the house, I like the house to be its original white um, frame, mm. uh, the body of the house. And then just the windows will be, the inserts will be that uh, sort of marigold yellow and the, uh, um, the orange is sort of a burnt orange. Uh, the house that was known on the island as the Peach Palace because the the, the stuff I removed was um, a color of peach unknown to nature. <laughs> and uh, and it was really charming in, in its own quirky way and own Vashon way. But over the years it faded and it faded. It became more peachy cream. beige and cream. And, right. Um, and so that was that run, you know, it's it during its hippie phase. And now I, I took off the siding, uh, the, the, the modern siding, and I'm going to go with this. The door is like, a, it's called Peacock Tail. It's a bright blue door. Oh, yes. And um, yeah, and, and so it'll just be the windows that will have the color. The rest of the house will be white. And uh, yeah, I think I think she'll be very happy because it's, I live out loud. I got a few loud colors. Uh, a lot of my friends are like, oh, you know, they're, they're all that are in design world and and you know they uh -huh. go like oh are you really going to paint it that color yeah i'm going to paint it that color because it live makes here. me happy it makes me happy <laughs> and so uh but i've gotten a lot of subtle uh you know tones people go you should do this it was like driftwood with a gray and a cream and a but that's not that's not me and i think it'll still really look good oh yeah, yeah. absolutely and they liked bright colors back in the day yeah yeah you know? and it, it's this house is it this house is all about bright colors you know, like I said, the couple who owned it before me were lovely, lovely people. And they were musicians, they were in theater, they were, you know, they have on the door, um, there's, it says in French, my French is bad, so I'll say it in English. It's like, this is the entrance for the artist. And I just left it on the door. <laughs> um, and that, it's just, that's very, uh, very evocative of what that house was all about. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just lovely. And of course it tends to be kind of gray here. It does. And to have uh, something with a spark of life, not just the, and in the wintertime, you know, the plants tend to lose their leaves mm -hmm. and everything gets a little quiet, but to have just these lovely little sparks of color yeah. 
really kind of gets you through the gray Pacific Northwest. It it does, and I tend to Drizzle. find that I um I grew I grew up in the South, all over the su Eastern Seaboard in the South. So I have all these things I grow from my childhood that I like. Like I have passion flower behind you, and there's jasmine over there. That, mm. That's an evergreen jasmine that does great. Um, you know, I have camellias here. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's really. Um, it's kind of fun to sort of grow plants you're familiar with in your childhood that you kind of take with you into your adulthood and they, they remind you of, yes. and I, I, you know, like I think I've planted 800,000 gardenias trying to get a gardenia <laughs> to grow, but there's like, a, I have a gardenia graveyard because they're just like, no, we don't want to grow here. It's the Northwest. They say we're hardy, but we really aren't. Mm -hmm. Or they say we don't need that much sun, but we really do. You yes. know, so, uh, I keep trying. I, I, I have a, another another variety I'm just trying right now. Yeah, so. and I find that's true with fruit and, and berry plants in the same way that it's true with flowers. People have these memories of being with their grandparents in the kitchen exactly. and cooking with their grandma and mm -hmm. the smells and being out in the yard and harvesting things. And they have these visceral experiences and they say, Oh, this looks like the one that uh, my grandma used to grow. Can I grow that here? You know, and and then we work together and say yes, you can or no, you can't. But here's one that looks like that, and so they get a chance to engage with their memories as well as with their mouth, and mm -hmm. it's just such a rich experience all the way around. It, it really is. I think like. Uh, for instance, rhubarb, like I never, because rhubarb never grew where in South Carolina or Virginia where I was or mm -hmm. uh, in Florida or Alabama. Um, and uh, so, or at least we never had it or had it, I had exposure to it. But when we go visit my grandparents who lived in Indiana, man, they were all about the rhubarb. So every summer it was like reconnecting with rhubarb yeah. pie for the <laughs> most part, rhubarb crisp, rhubarb slump, rhubarb, you know, uh -huh. rhubarb, anything doughy and sugary <laughs> and good. Yes. You know? So, yeah. So yeah. I grow rhubarb now. Of course. Yeah. Now, this is a beautiful water feature you have here. Oh, thanks. Um, th uh, this water feature, uh, I, I've become a huge fan of water features. And over the years, I started out with, um, a, I had like a, uh, what do you call them? A kiddie pool. I had a kiddie pool that I, I, I put bricks in, so around, surrounded it so you couldn't see oh, right. uh, the cartoons that were on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did that and I had a, a little fountain. I finally got a larger fountain. And, and the reason I, I, uh, I mean, it's one of, the, one of my favorite things about this, uh, my garden, because over the years it, it's, it's, it's evolved. And like, even now there's like a ton of um, algae in it, but I don't care because the algae acts as a platform for all the bees. So I have, a, I have six hives. So the bees are always here and then they can just land on the algae. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's a benefit. It's not, a, it's not a problem. And then eventually the, the algae, I'll take it out if it gets too bad. Um, I have water lilies. Um, there are dragonflies this year for the first time. I, they crawl up the side of the, uh, the vessel and then they, they have an exoskeleton. They just sort of sit there and they crawl out of the exoskeleton. And then they just sit there for hours on hours to dry their their body and their wings and then they you watch you can watch the whole thing and there are frogs in february and march just croaking up and i usually have frog eggs it's like there's so much activity and then uh the birds it's such a great thing because i don't have bird feeders um but i have the fountain and so i put in sticks in the fountain so they could have a place to land i found that some small birds weren't very at, uh, very good at landing and they'd fall into them oh, no. so i didn't want to have any more fatalities ah. so I put this thing and that's been perfect. And, and there'll be some days you'll come out here and there'll be uh, a beautiful f a flock of, a um, uh, small flock of finches, goldfinches. Mm. There'll be uh, cedar waxwings, mm. always robins, nuthatches. Um, it's really fun. And I can just sit over on my porch drinking coffee very quietly, Sorry. spying on them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's really fun. It's, it's, it's better than TV. Well, and it's so dry here in the summertime. You know, I mean, we're drier than Phoenix in Western mm -hmm. Washington. And you think of us as being soft and fluffy and cool and wet all the time. But in the summertime, it's unbelievably dry. So to have the opportunity to have a part of your garden where you have the sound of the water running, which always makes me feel cooler. Mm -hmm. And of course, then I'm, I'm even seeing bees landing on the wood here and taking the moisture 
and the birds and the dragonflies and the frogs, which yeah. eat the bugs. Exactly. I mean, you're increasing the wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really like increasing habitat because everybody eats, mm -hmm. you know, the birds eat the bugs. Yeah. Some bugs eat the other bugs. Mm -hmm. And it just, the more you have something in a system that's eating things, the more eating that's going on, yeah. the less likely you're going to have overabundance of aphids or mosquitoes. mosquitoes. Yeah. Right, exactly. Because that was initially when I, I did it and I, I hadn't, there was no really biology in the water. It was just sort of mm. a little too clean. And so then I just started letting it get a little too dirty. And it wasn't dirty, it was just, it was busy with things in it. It was alive. It was alive. And so that really um, counteracted the mosquitoes taking over so then there were things there were bugs in there and there was there were, i had tadpoles that were eating and so now it's not a problem if you can't even before i could see mosquitoes in there now mm -hmm. I, I don't and i was putting in uh barley straw and other things that are supposed to thwart their uh great reproduction but i don't i don't know if that works yeah you just let nature do her yeah. thing it's elegant and it works very nice thanks this is a really gorgeous mini dwarf tree how old is this tree oh gosh um probably 12 years old at least yeah. and i get a lot of questions on the phone where people ask me what's the difference between a dwarf and a mini dwarf tree a mini dwarf tree doesn't really get any bigger than a human being it's it's short this tree 15 years old it's quite wide but it's really really short so that's what makes it great in a container mm -hmm. um or in an area where you don't have a lot of space or you don't want to have to lean up. This is quite a productive tree. This is... It's a really productive tree. It's Belle de Boscoup, uh, and it's a, it's a heavy producer. Uh, what's kind of unique about it is, which it's what really surprised me, I have semi-dwarf apples that are bigger, 10, 12, 13, 14 feet tall. But my mini, uh, my mini apples, what's surprising to me was, they outproduce some of my larger trees. And so this one is so heavy. I'll get probably uh, two cases of apples out of this tree and, um, and they're all pretty healthy. It has a really good uh, natural tendency to drop small apples. Mm. So I don't have to really thin too much. It's a really yeah. good apple. Bramley seedling is another really good one. Uh, that's a good mini. Uh, it, it tends to be a biennial producer every other year. Mm -hmm. Heavy, not so much. Heavy, not so much. Yeah. I just love this form. So for people that don't want to have to get on a ladder or for people who garden with kids, can you imagine how much fun it would be to be a kid and to get under this big, beautiful tree and have a little playhouse? I mean, ah. So there are trees to fit everybody's size needs. This is amazing. People say you can't grow figs in the Pacific Northwest because we don't get a lot of summer heat. But you have three beautiful fig trees here. Who's this? This one is uh, White Genoa. Mm. I got it from a, a friend who lives in uh, Rainier Valley and uh, their family was Italian and they uh, they gave me a start of it. Uh, and it's, it's a great, it's great. You can tell this one's totally ripe because see how it, it moves like that? It's really, this mm. one doesn't quite, it's not quite ripe. And uh, I have one a little higher that tells you, see, it looks, you go like, is that right? Nope, it, there's no, see, this becomes, try, how would you explain it? Oh yeah, it, it's translucent. It sort mm -hmm. of has a, almost like a, you're looking through skin and yes. uh, veins. And, and it also splits, yep. which is the sugar expressing, there's so much sugar in here, it's pulling the moisture out of the skin and causing the split. I've also heard that you can tell when the, the throat starts to uh, shrivel just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll even see a little drop of liquid come out of the base of the fruit. Yeah. And it feels heavy for its size. This one feels kind of like a styrofoam. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like a water balloon. Right. Yeah. And and one thing you need to know about uh, fig is no, if you pick them early, they're not going to ripen. They're just, they're going to be what, what they are. So this one's ripe. I picked it. This one I won't pick. And if I did pick it, unlike a lot of other fruit like apples or peaches that ripen off the tree or pears, figs don't ripen off the tree. Mm -hmm. So you kind of just have a, 
cotton, yeah. cottony, not very good thing, you know. <laughs> and you're sad because you've taken it off exactly. and you kept it from being luscious and wonderful. Exactly. And you just yeah. have to beat the birds. That's the thing. You, they have, the birds have, I think they have like a, a, a iPhone with the timer set. Oh, 642, the figs are ripe. And then they, <laughs> they fly in and just devour and denude your trees. Yeah, so, this... Uh, Harvesting figs is one of those things that you do in the moment. You see mm -hmm. it's ripe, you drop everything, you go over, you pick it, and you enjoy it. Yep. And that's the way you do it. Oh, no, this is the holy grail of the Pacific Northwest fruit grower, a beautiful peach. Who is this? This is Nanaimo, and uh, it's, my, it's my favorite peach I grow. I don't, for one, I don't spray anything on it. It grows outside and uh, there's, uh, there's minimal peach leaf curl and it produces beautiful sweet fruit. And so I've tried about every <laughs> peach leaf curl variety. This is definitely my favorite. Nice. Um, it, uh, it, it has a really good flavor and, uh, and it's, pretty, it's, it's, uh, it's a good producer. And I just want to tell people, peaches don't always look like really beautiful trees in the landscape. Sometimes they can be a little, uh, little thin, but wow, does it make up for it to be able to get gorgeous fruit like this off your tree. So tuck it someplace where it's not going to bother you, but do grow it for lovelies like that. So I see you have a number of beautiful hives here. Um, yeah, I do. I, um, I got bees, uh, probably about 10 years ago and I, I, it's, it's a hard admission on camera, but I'm not a good beekeeper. I'm like, I'm just not a good beekeeper. I tried and I tried and I tried. And so a friend of mine, who's a really good beekeeper, she said, how about I put hives on your property? And I said, awesome. Yeah. And so she handles them and, um, she, I get a jar every once in a while, which is great. And I'm just happy to have the, uh, the bees on the property for my fruit trees. And plus I have some great old trees that are really benefit her hives like uh, black locust. They're like hundred year old, 200 year old trees. I have a mm. hundred year old uh, maple that has those beautiful racemes and cottonwood that, and they all sort of are progressively perfect for the bees uh, collecting the, the bloom sequence yeah the bloom sequence that's it yeah. yeah 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 that is fantastic and i see this in a lot well i see this as an emerging trend in a lot of areas where there are beekeepers who don't have land but want to learn how to keep bees and want to be able to keep bees for people that maybe are too busy that have an orchard even a small orchard and don't have the time or don't find themselves good at beekeeping it's a great fit it's really a wonderful way to share resources. Yeah, it, it, it's it's fantastic because um, Annie is her name, and uh, she she has them kind of all over the island. What really helped her is to concentrate them instead of having them in ten places or twelve places to have them in three or four places, but have the same number of hives. So like there are six hives here, mm. and she can like park right there and. Uh, you know, come up and tend to all the bees at the same time without having to go to six different spots or locations. Nice, really nicely done. And we have hives too that we just started to keep on our property that we don't even plan to take honey out of. We just have them there for the bees and we call them sanctuary hives. So here we are in the greenhouse. Any peach aficionado in the Pacific Northwest would have to have a greenhouse in order to trial <laughs> all of these beautiful, beautiful fruits. So I'm gonna let you take it away and tell us about all the different varieties that you're growing here. Um, yeah, I love peaches. It's, you know, like we all, have, I think people have their favorite fruits. Um, peaches are mine. I, um, I've always loved peaches and I live in an area that it's a challenge to grow a peach. So I, I, I'm lucky enough or fortunate enough to have a, large greenhouse, a 30 by 70. And so I started planting peaches, peach trees in the, uh, in the ground in this high tunnel hoop house. And I started trialing them and uh, seeing what did well and what didn't. And um, it's been really great because peaches like it in here so much better than out in the real world, um, at least in the Pacific Northwest. And so the two I successfully grow out in outside of the hoop house are uh, uh, Indian free and uh, Nanaimo, those two are my, are my favorites. But inside, this is one of my most successful ones right now is, oh, see, I didn't plan that. Um, it's a peregrine uh, peach. I have a friend in England who uh, grows these and said they were, real, they were popular backyard peach in England. 
and they're a white peach and they're they're just fantastic um, and I don't spray anything so uh, this is what you get these beautiful green they look green on the outside but they're they're pure white on the inside so this peach uh, is what they call a genetic dwarf. It, it doesn't get any higher than six, seven, eight feet. Um, it's on super dwarfing stock and it's a beautiful tree. I think, I think they're very ornamental. This one's called honey babe and you can see the peaches are well hidden in the tree. And sometimes you won't even know you have a crop and then all of a sudden they just drop, <laughs> you know, because, and they're really good because birds don't even find them because they're so covered up. But they, they take a while to, to mature. These are like a September peach, like early September. But they're really great. And it's a beautiful tree, beautiful blossoms, like a double, uh, double ornamental, uh, super fuchsia pink blossom. Good for containers too. Here's another little uh, genetic uh, dwarf peach. I just planted that this this year and it's pretty much doubled in size. Uh, so they're, they're, uh, it's, it has really good conditions of, of good watering, nice sunlight. Uh, no excessive moisture and this one is pick z um one of those cute little names for a cute little tree uh, it's a nectarine and so i'm excited because i haven't uh i haven't ventured into nectarine so now i'm i need to learn about those so i'll let you know how this goes at some point this little guy is el dorado and this one is, is has a real reputation as being a, a truly delicious sweet you know like when they say it actually has a peachy flavor and um, this one is, is pretty renowned for that it's on a super dwarfing root stock um, and it's it suffered a little wear because i dropped my shovel on it of course the shovel hit it and split it in half so i had to try to get it nurtured back into its uh into a, a little better shape so i right now i've taped it with electrical tape so we'll see how that goes it but it uh it could work i think it could work it'll fuse back but anyway this is el dorado peach and I'm, I'm really excited about this one it's supposed to be a really flavorful peach this is one of my early successes in the greenhouse it's a, a what they call a donut peach or a bagel peach it's a white peach and uh its cultivar name is a uh, galaxy uh really good um it, they're they're sort of a firm meaty thing and when you look at them you're sort of surprised by the color it's it's just almost a beigey white but it's it's pure sugar it's packed with sugar um, when my mom and sister were visiting um i held out going like they got to get here they got to get here because these are ripe and i want them to try some and when they did they they pretty much went through the whole uh the whole bunch that i had and, and said they were some of the best peaches they ever had so bagel peach it's a flat it's a little different they're easier i like them because they're almost easier to pick you i i snip them so you don't bruise them when you when you pick them so i like that aspect of them too so galaxy uh, bagel or donut peach. This peach is called Contender. Um, it's a popular commercial peach and I haven't picked it yet so I don't know how it tastes. I'm sure if it's a commercial peach it tastes good. Um, and what's great about it is it tends to have if you have a narrow area it's more of a vertical growth pattern according to everything I've read and it, and it sort of I, I, I cut the top of it off hoping it would do a little more spreading but it just shot up a new growth uh, that was again more vertical. So, uh, yeah, contender. Uh, supposed to be delicious, and it gets to be a tall, narrow tree. This peach tree is called Vivid, and um, a lot of uh, reviews I read about it. They say it's the prettiest peach there is. Well, I think they're all pretty beautiful, but it is a pretty peach. It's it has a light blush uh, skin. It has this little sort of nose at the end, a little ski jump nose. Uh, it's it's quite beautiful. It's like what you see in a lot of Asian art, that type of shape of a, of a peach. I had two and they were both delicious. So that was his first, this is his second year. So I just let two grow so it could uh, put more energy into the roots and the branches, but it, they were really good. It was a vivid peach. This peach tree, I was really eager to grow because I, because I read the book, um, The Epitaph of a, of a Peach, and it was basically about the most perfect peach and the families that grew this peach and um, and how it was sort of a mainstay of, of peach orchards and so highly revered. Um, and it's a sun crest and it really is good. It, it, it deserves the, the accolades. Um, I've harvested three or four. I, I harvest them a little bit uh, early. Uh, so they're firm. I don't, if they're too soft, you end up bruising them when you pick them. Uh, so, and then they ripen beautifully on a table with just a cloth down for a couple days. And then when you can start, when you can smell them, they are, 
like you, you go, is that an angel singing? Yes, it is. And it's that good a peach. So Suncrest, I, I, I love this peach. This uh, tree is uh, called the 49er. And uh, it's, it's a classic peach, I'm pretty sure, because it seems to be around, it seems to have been around for a long time, but it's, it's around for a long time for a reason. It has great flavor, it's easy to grow, and it produces really large peaches. I mean, this is sort of a, a, a young tree. It's less than uh, two, maybe three years old. And the, the peaches are a relatively large size. Um, and I, I have not had one yet. They're not quite ripe. They're a little too firm. There's greenness here. And uh, if I may bring up a subject about peaches, about determining if a peach is ripe, I, I, I try to uh, tell my friends to treat a peach like an avocado. Like you, you, an avocado is never really ripe at the store. You take it home, you put it on the counter, you let it ripen for a few days. You don't expect it to be ripe at the grocery store. If, if, if people say they want to ripe peach, you don't want to ripe peach. You want a close to ripe peach. If, if you are packing ripe peaches, you basically have jam by the time they get to your grocery store. So quit squeezing. This is like my, my total rant about when I'm in a grocery store, it's like I almost lunge at people and go, quit squeezing the peaches. Because it, it takes a full year. It takes so much to get a good peach. And you have people at grocery stores that pick up peaches and they squeeze them. They, they physically squeeze them hard to see if they're soft. And a lot of new peaches are, aren't soft anyway. And, and they're never going to be that's never going to determine anything. It's a waste of a peach. So don't do it. Don't squeeze them. If they're firm, they have beautiful color. They have heavy weight. They're great. And then don't put them in the refrigerator. No, no, no. Refrigerator will get them mealy again. So you just keep them out. Put like put down a cloth, a dish towel, a linen tea towel if you're fancy. Put down the peaches and then you put another uh, towel over it, like a light towel, like a linen or something or cotton um, so it can breathe. And then you just check it each day. It's, does it smell good? Um, is the color more robust? Is there a, a really light softness that doesn't require you to squeeze it, but you can feel it at, and there's no green on the end of the, of the stem base. Um, so, you know, that's the way to do it. Don't squeeze the peaches, you just ruin them. And if you don't believe me, squeeze a peach, then buy it, then take it home and let it ripen. And then when you cut into it, you can see all your thumbprints that are bruise marks on the peach. Um, we have to stop this insanity. <laughs> no squeezing the peaches. What a treat this has been. Thank you so much, Tom. Oh, for... man, this, <laughs> it was my pleasure. This was like playtime. I had a play date. This it, is great. It really was I really fun enjoyed it. seeing all these beautiful trees, getting a chance to just kind of enjoy the history that's here and that really shines in your blog. I mean, I see it, I read it. It's a treat to come and see that that's really how it is here. And I've got my peaches. I have not squeezed them. Thank you. I'm gonna take them home and put them under a tea towel. <laughs> my, work is, my work is done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This is Laura from Rain Tree Nursery, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>